Hi, this time I wanted to talk about the differences between board game systems and role-playing game systems. I think this video could be of use for someone that has been playing board games for a long time and is thinking about playing role-playing games. That way that person will be able to identify the main differences between both systems, although there are many board games and role-playing games. I think there are some recurring elements within each category. This video could also be of help perhaps to someone for someone that has been playing role-playing games for some time, but he always he or she always plays role-playing games as a board game. Never really made the jump into role-playing game territory. They are using the, the systems in RPGs in a very dry and dully, dull mechanical way without taking advantage of the rest of the system. It's just the tip of the iceberg. So let's start by covering some elements, some things about board games. Board games are, are really fun because they have so many limits within their rule sets. If you take away too much when it comes to the limitations from board games, then it starts to, to turn into something else. The fun thing about board games is that you can overcome challenges, you can beat other players or even the AI or artificial intelligence system. You know how uh, solo and co-op board games have become really popular in recent times. So it's all about defeating the other players or, the, or defeating the system itself, the AI, using uh, the elements within the limitations of that board game. And that's very different from role-playing games because role-playing games offer so many possibilities. The systems in RPGs, they are incredibly flexible, perhaps you could say universal, versatile. So for example, Let's say that you are playing your typical dungeon crawler board game. Maybe you have a spell that is called something like Frostbolt. So Frostbolt inflicts five points of cold damage to the enemy. That's it. When you take a look at the description of the spell, that is it. But when you look at different um, RPG spells, you will see that there are more... There's simply more depth to each spell. You have perhaps a Frostbolt type of spell and it says something like, oh, it inflicts uh, this number of points of damage, cold damage, but it can also uh, freeze water and it, it can lower the temperature. So it has so many other um, logical elements or things that you would expect of a, of a Frostbolt spell. So now you can use that spell for other things. Maybe you are moving through the desert and because of the RPG rule set, your character is suffering from the hit. It's too hot. So now you can use your frost spell, perhaps to uh, get the, the water supply of the group uh, quite cold, ice cold, and that helps you uh, withstand the hit. The same thing could be said about um, spells that have to do with like burning hands or uh, you're uh, shooting some fireball or whatever. They can be used in battle, but because of the effect of fire, you can also use them in survival situations. If you are in a cold environment, you can also light a fire quite easily with those spells or keep yourself warm, light up some, some branches, all of that. There are some spells like Magic Missile, a perfect comparison. Take a look at the Dungeons & Dragons board games. When it comes to Magic Missile in those board games, it's just something like, oh, you can inflict this number of um, hit points, hit points on, of damage on the enemy that is one tile away. That's it. But in, I think, pretty much any version of Roll of Dungeons and Dragons and pseudo clones and retro clones as well, you have the description of magic missile. This is the only spell, well, one of the few spells, perhaps the more popular spells that you can use in a cramped or narrow situation because magic missile is basically like a homing missile that always hits the enemy unlike fireball that explodes and fills the entire corridor and could get you and your party killed that is if the enemy is too close and you use fireball 
you may end up getting cut in the radius of the blast but with magic missile you basically like i said you shoot this uh, homing projectile missile it hits the enemy as long as you can see the enemy you can even shoot it when the enemy is engaged in melee so that gets you thinking the description of the spell tells you that as long as you can see the enemy within the range of the spell you can attack the enemy unerringly unless the enemy has some sort of a shield spell going you can strike the enemy just take, looking at the enemy as long as that enemy is not completely uh, concealed or behind cover you can your eyes are basically the targeting system so what if you use a, a surface that reflects the image of the enemy that is around the corner that is a creative way of using magic missile maybe there is a sort of like a, a u-turn and you are in the other side of the turn and you see the enemy reflected on a shield a polished shield on the wall or maybe you prepare the situation beforehand and you place the small mirror in the corner of the u-turn and now you can see the enemy just around the corner and you can shoot the magic missile from uh, your own section from behind the wall the missile is going to follow the trajectory of the enemy so that's a creative way of using those spells or maybe you have some other spells that, that are similar and you use this sort of like a scrying effect or a wizard eye sort of spell to see the enemy from afar or in the case if you are using familiars in some uh, role-playing games you can uh, see the enemy through the eyes of your familiar that will be a way of using the familiar as the targeting system so that's how you take advantage of those spells but what when it comes to melee and, and just to further clarify that cannot be accomplished in board games because it takes away from the limitations the balance could be messed up if you start do to do that the system is too open too freeform and it starts to become a role-playing game instead of a of a board game you start to throw away those limitations and those balanced encounters and scenarios and the um relationship with the rest of the board game system the the that way, the way that the the spells relate to other actions maneuvers that you can carry out within the board game system the, the balance is thrown off so that's why board games put so so many lim limitations to balance things when it comes to combat this also applies what about charge charging at the enemy in a board game it's pretty straight straightforward if you have that you are charging at the enemy you probably get a bonus to attack and damage but when it comes to a role-playing game you can charge at the enemy from so many different directions maybe you decide to swing from a chandelier and just land on top of the enemy that counts as a charge if you are flying or levitating you can uh, fly downwards towards the enemy and that also could count as a charge when it comes to grappling in board games if they actually include some sort of grappling me mechanic it's also it's quite limited but in role-playing games perhaps you decide that you want to take the enemy and smash that enemy's head against a railing or some sort of fence with spikes or some concrete structure and you make your grapple check according to the rules of the rpg and you hurt the enemy but perhaps let's say that you decided to smash the enemy's head against the concrete structure now you not only inflict damage perhaps the enemy is now under the dazed condition he got stunned or something so now penalties will be applied to different checks saving throws and the like if you are killing a lot of enemies maybe you uh, killed four or five enemies and you could inform the game master i am now uh, stepping back five feet behind this zone where i killed the enemies with the intent of having the reinforcements that are coming uh, to slip on the blood on the floor so you're using all of the blood that you spilled when killing the enemies as an advantage as a hazard against the enemy so now the reinforcements enter the room they charge at you and because the floor is so slippery with the blood of all of your enemies and you're just behind that line of blood the enemies will have to perhaps make a saving throw or make a dexterity check so that they don't slip on the blood and they fall they end up prone giving you an advantage in battle so as you can see all of that applies to a role-playing game but not necessarily so in a board game 
I think there are many board games that attempt to approach that flexibility when it comes to the system, uh, assist systems in combat, uh, sometimes in exploration. And that's another good point, skills. In role-playing games, you can use uh, climbing, you can use anything related uh, to the knowledge of chemicals, it depends. So you can interact in so many ways with the environment. But when it comes to a board game, you usually have those uh, nice looking boards with tables containing like potions and flasks. And um, you have different structures, walls, uh, boxes. And unless it is within the system, unless it is permitted in the scenario, you cannot interact with those things. You cannot try to see if you can mix and match the, the chemicals, the substances, art activate different artifacts. You cannot climb on top of the, the tables. They are usually there like an obstacle. Like in HeroQuest, you have furniture, but you cannot interact with that furniture unless you specify that in the scenario. And then it starts to turn into a role-playing game. Although I love using uh, furniture in, in simple ways in, in HeroQuest, especially when it comes to creating my own random tables. Uh, this came as a sort of idea. Because it, it, when I played Advanced Hero Quest, you do have some furniture that, oh, make a roll to see what you find inside the furniture. So I, I like to use it like that. But like I said, in board games, normally you cannot interact with the scenario itself because the mission or the scenario uh, would fall apart. Maybe you have this quest or situation where, oh, you need to get from this side of the battlefield to this other side. And how easy it would be if you were allowed to climb the bookshelves, if you were allowed to climb those like tower-like structures, the scenario would end quite quickly because that lateral thinking style is very much rewarded in role-playing games that even the more abstract role-playing games, to a certain degree, they are a great... Uh, a somewhat accurate simulation of reality within a fictional setting, unlike board games that sometimes they feel a bit like puzzle games. So you can definitely tell apart the differences between board game systems and role-playing game systems. And there are probably many other examples. And like I said, this is not to uh, diminish the, the fun of board games. Like I said, wh what I enjoy of board games are those limitations, working within those limitations, trying to figure out the puzzle, the puzzle of how to uh, defeat the other players, the puzzle of how to defeat the AI as presented in a solo or co-op game. Now that I think about it, I think it would be interesting if board games also tried to implement or simulate uh, travel mechanics uh, or aspects of survivalism because there are many board games that kind of like try to represent the typical Dungeons and Dragons experience. But when it comes to journeys and traveling across lands and such, there aren't too many, in my opinion, that accurately represent that. One that comes to mind is the amazing board game, the Mage Knight board game. Such an amazing game. When you move across mountains, lakes, you have spells that allow you to fly or walk across water or have an easier time when moving through the mountains. There is a, a character that actually has um, an advantage when getting into the more dangerous places in the map. Sometimes you have to travel when it's day, daytime, when uh, during uh, through the forests, or sometimes you need to wait until it is night to move through the desert because otherwise it's going to be too difficult because of the the hit you uh, need to spend more movement points when moving through those desert spaces so i think that's a great way of handling things i hope more board games implement those travel or survival mechanics but in role playing games there are so many systems that focus completely on the journey and I hope this video was informative and entertaining. That's pretty much it. I would like to know your thoughts about this. Do you think there are uh, many differences between board game systems and role-playing game systems? Mm, what are your experiences uh, playing uh, board games and role-playing games? Did you sometimes think, oh, I wish this board game played a bit more like a role-playing game? 
Or maybe you were playing a role-playing game and you felt overwhelmed with all of the possibilities and you said, oh, I wish there were more limits. I think uh, those cases will be very rare because some people um, enjoy that flexibility, that free farmness at times when it comes to RPG systems. I remember when Dungeons and Dragons 4th edition first came out, a lot of people were impressed. At first I was also a bit impressed with the way that they balanced the attacks, but then you started to notice that they were pretty much uh, creating like an MMO RPG experience in tabletop RPG format, but not in the, the way of interacting with the game world. It felt too mechanical in my opinion, so that a lot of people got turned off for, from Dungeons and Dragons because of 4th edition. It was pretty repetitive at times, you see all of these dungeon masters that it, the adventures always started the same. You had the adventurers gathering up in, in a tavern or in some house or whatever, and they found out about this quest. It, it felt very video gamey, like Monster Hunter, like you arrive in this place, you choose a quest, and then you go into this mission, but it was so limited with all of the, oh, you can use this power, but you need to to rest uh, once a day, but the power felt, like I said, too video gamey. And so a lot of people ended up playing Dungeons & Dragons 4th Edition as a board game. Some people actually prefer the Dungeons & Dragons board games, you know, Castle Ravenloft, uh, The Legend of Dritz, uh, Wrath of Ashardon, because they felt like uh, Dungeons & Dragons 4th Edition, but uh, without the pretense of, of being an RPG. And like I said, this could be... Uh, a specific opinion. If you like Dungeons and Dragons 4th Edition and you still man still manage to uh, handle the RPG aspect, th that's great for you. But some other people got turned off because uh, from the system because of that. I personally pre prefer the 13th H RPG. It felt like the best elements from Dungeons and Dragons 4th Edition with all of those in the. Uh, details or nuances that oh your own unique thing and you have your your patrons or the uh, different uh, um, powerful characters within the game world sometimes supporting you sometimes working against you sometimes you had like a mixed feelings relationship with them sometimes they helped you other times they uh, hindered your efforts so i really liked that and i think that that was the thematic or story based element that dungeons and dragons fourth edition needed in a way, if you were to follow that particular evolutionary line of Dungeons & Dragons 4th edition, you could say that the 13th Age feels, some, feels more like a 5th edition, if we were to follow that evolutionary line. Well, thank you, that is the... <laughs> uh, that is, we have 5th edition, but it doesn't feel like that evolved from Dungeons & Dragons 4th edition, it feels like a different concept, like a separate Dungeons & Dragons concept. Thank you for watching this part of the review. Uh, thank you for your likes and your comments. If you have any questions or comments, please let me know. And thank you so much to those of you that are going the extra mile to support the channel. If anyone else wishes to further support the channel, the information on how to do that will be in the description below. Once again, thank you and uh, see you later.